A system of safe ports is vital to the prosperity and security of the United States. The United States Coast Guard is charged by law with maintaining the safety of these ports. As a captain of the port inspector, you represent the Coast Guard and play a major role in the port safety program. The importance of your appearance and attitude cannot be overemphasized. You will notice some variations in uniforms in this film. During its production, the captain of the port uniform was standardized and now consists of white coveralls, white safety helmet, and black safety shoes. A neat, proper uniform worn by a courteous, business-like inspector will earn the respect of his shipmates, his superiors, and most important of all, the crews and operators of vessels and facilities which he inspects. The Code of Federal Regulations, Title 46, Parts 146 to 149, specifically Part 146.02 to .06, charges the Coast Guard with enforcement of these regulations governing the transportation and storage of dangerous cargo on board vessels. These specific and detailed regulations pertaining to vessels and barges are contained in Parts 35, 146, and 151 of Title 46, Code of Federal Regulations, commonly called CFR 46. Inspectors must have a working knowledge of this information and should always have a copy of CFR 46 available during inspections. Vessel inspection is the backbone of the program for enforcement of these regulations. The success of this program depends largely on how well port safety inspectors do their jobs. Inspection starts with a call on the master, or in his absence, the first mate of the vessel. At this meeting, it is important to establish a cordial relationship. One man should go topside to start the outside inspection, while the other explains the procedures and purpose of the inspection. Also at this point, the COTP Vessel Inspection Report, CG4393, should be introduced. This report sets forth, item by item, the requirements which must be met by the vessel. Inspectors should be thoroughly familiar with the instructions at the top of the reverse side of the form. Information for the upper part of the form should have already been obtained from the captain of the port files and entered. The inspector enters the date and time and then verifies the entries with the ship's master or mate. Name of the vessel, flag under which it sails, its berth or anchorage, estimated time of departure, type of vessel, kind of document, home port, official number, length, pilot number, type of propulsion, the gross or net tonnage. Next comes the certificate of inspection for the vessel. Four items of information are required here. The expiration date, who it was issued by, the route, and service. Now for voyage data. Number of the voyage. Next port of call. And the last port visited. Then comes location of boarding information. Four items. Chart number. A prominent point of reference on the chart. It's bearing from the vessel and the distance. Since this ship is at a pier rather than at anchor, these items do not apply and are left blank. The next items on the list are on the right-hand center part of the inspection form. They require the name, address, and zip code of the vessel owner, the charterer, the agent, 
and the master or mate. Then an entry for the date the vessel was last boarded. This information is obtained from the captain of the port files. Next comes the boarding checklist. This list of items has a yes and no column and instructions to leave not applicable items blank. These questions can generally be satisfied by the master or mate of the vessel. First is whether or not any dangerous cargo is aboard. If the answer is yes, then such cargo must be listed in the dangerous cargo portion of the form. Next, a look at the vessel's National Cargo Bureau certificate and a check in the Yes column. Then right on down the line of questions, with the ship's master providing the answers and producing the necessary papers. Has this vessel had violations on previous visits to this port? This item should be rechecked in the captain of the port files. Is this her first U.S. port? Was the advance notice of arrival given the captain of the port? Has the vessel received port dispersal instructions? Is there an international shore connection aboard? Is the vessel's load line submerged? This can be checked as inspectors come aboard. Does the vessel have a current load line certificate? Is the vessel a participant in the AMVER program? If not, give the master information on AMVER. Is there a letter of compliance aboard? Is the oil record book available? This item is only for vessels of over 500 gross tons which use oil for fuel. If this is a tanker, is it gas free? And is the vessel in ballast? The bottom part of the form is devoted to the listing of dangerous cargo which is aboard. The information required here, name, class, weight, etc., should be obtained from the dangerous cargo manifest. While the items on the front side of the vessel inspection form are being satisfied in conference with the ship's master, the other inspector has been taking care of the top side part of the inspection. These requirements are listed on the reverse side of CG 4393. The instructions at the top part of the page should have been studied before starting the inspection. They should now be followed closely. Next is a note reminding inspectors to inspect cargo and papers for compliance with 46 CFR 146. Directly below this note are the specific statements taken from 46 CFR 146 which must be satisfied. And yes, no, and C columns are on the left hand side of the form. The C column is for use when a discrepancy is corrected immediately during the inspection. Items which do not apply during an inspection should be left blank. Whenever possible, the topside inspector should be accompanied by a member of the ship's crew. The first item requires the inspector to determine that the handling and stowage of dangerous cargo is supervised by a responsible person. This determination usually must be based on personal contact and observation of the man. Next, check the dangerous cargo manifest, list, or stowage plan to see that it is properly made out, listing all dangerous cargo, the amount, and where it is stowed. Dangerous cargo should also be inspected for proper markings and labels. Check areas where dangerous cargo is being handled for the required no smoking signs. Be sure any welding or hot work is being done in a safe manner and that the captain of the port has issued a permit covering this work. Were papers such as shipping orders or dock receipts available as required? And last in this column, 
the question of compliance with 46 CFR parts 146.20 through 146.29. Some 700 pages of the detailed regulations covering the handling, loading, and storage of explosives, inflammable solids, oxidizing materials, corrosive liquids, compressed gases, poisons, combustible liquids, hazardous articles, and other dangerous cargo. Like the other items in this series, the inspector must have a good working knowledge of parts 146 to 149 of Title 46 to conduct a good inspection. The lower half of the reverse side of the inspection form is left blank for the entry of instances of violations other than those listed on the form. Item 6 of the instructions direct that the inspection not be limited to checklist items. These entries should include the statute or regulation which was violated and the nature of the non-compliance. A common example of such violations would be failure to apply a poison B label to the drums of a class B poison. The last item to be completed on the form is the boarding officer's signature. Where more than one man performs the inspection, the senior man signs the form. So the inspection of a cargo vessel has been completed and the busy ship's master can get back to his work. Inspection procedures for tank vessels are basically the same as for cargo vessels. However, there is a much greater interface with the waterfront facility during liquid cargo transfer operations than during dry cargo operations. The waterfront facility inspection report form CG4200 is being revised to reflect this interrelation. The revised form will be used together with a vessel inspection form CG4393A in cases where transfer operations are in progress. In the meantime, inspection teams must be alert to assure compliance with the waterfront facility regulation during their inspections. Should violation of these regulations be observed, the operation should be stopped until the situation is corrected. Particular attention is invited to 33 CFR 126.15 O and the oil pollution regulations contained in 33 CFR 154, 155, and 156. Try to develop a cordial relationship with the ship's officers you'll be working with on the inspection and try to be helpful. Answer any questions they may have about the inspection. The inspection form for tank vessels is CG 4393A. And the front side is the same as for cargo vessels, which we have already covered in detail. The instructions for using the form are at the top of the reverse side of the form and are also the same as for the cargo vessel. Directly below the instructions is a note directing boarding officers to inspect the cargo and papers of tank vessels and barges to assure compliance with 46 CFR parts 35 and 151. Part 35 covers special operating requirements, which includes everything from shipping papers to plugging of scuppers and closing of sea valves. And Part 151 covers the requirements for unmanned barges. The specific items to be included in your inspection are listed on the center section of the form and have yes, no, and C columns on the left-hand side. As indicated in item four of the instructions, the C column should be only checked when a violation is corrected before the inspection is completed. Any items not applicable to the vessel being inspected should be left blank. The first item on the checklist is for the inspector to determine that the person on watch is not under the influence of liquor or stimulant. This should be done by casual contact and observation. If there is such indication, the ship's master or mate should be advised immediately. The next item is to check for the required warning signs at the gangway. On this vessel, the sign was observed as the inspectors came aboard. 
A warning is also required on the radio room to prevent transmission during handling of dangerous cargo. Next is the requirement for vessels at dockside to display a red flag during daytime and a red light at night when transferring bulk cargo. These warnings must be displayed so as to be visible from all sides. If transferring bulk cargo while at anchor, only a red flag shall be displayed. The next item is that a licensed officer be present on tank vessels. On this vessel, the master is on board, so a check goes in the yes column. Next, the inspector must determine that designated areas and times have been set aside when smoking will be authorized. Scuppers must be plugged during transfer operations, except on tank vessels using water for deck cooling. Flame screens are required over all cargo tank hatches, eulage holes, and Butterworth plates. The inspector must also determine that a sufficient number of crew members are on board to permit safe transfer of cargo. His inspection must include a sharp lookout for prohibited explosives on board. Also, all cargo transfer connections must be checked to be sure they are tight and drip pans or buckets must be placed under cargo hose connections. Prior to loading, the master or senior deck officer of a manned tank vessel must execute a declaration of inspection prior to bulk cargo transfer and must have a copy available for review. This document is generally checked by the inside inspector. That completes the required items under part 35 of title 46 CFR. There is one item under Part 38 which must be satisfied. This is the requirement for a remotely controlled quick shutoff valve. It must be operative from the remote control to pass inspection. That is the final item on the checklist for tank vessels. The remaining items all of which are covered in Title 46 CFR, Part 151, pertain to inspection of unmanned barges carrying dangerous cargo. For barges, as for tank vessels, the front side of CG 4393A must be completed in detail. And the six items of instructions apply as well. Now on to the items on the checklist, starting with the determination that persons on duty are not under the influence of liquor or stimulants. Here again, as with cargo and tank vessels, this should be determined by casual contact and observation. Next, look around for the required warning signs and cargo information cards. These must meet the requirements set forth in Title 46 CFR, Part 151.452E. The warning signs must be at least two feet by three feet and have black letters at least three inches high on a white background. They must be displayed in full view from both port and starboard. Also, the cargo being carried must be identified by cargo information cards. They must be at least seven by nine and one half inches and mounted in full view. They must also be visible from all sides. When at anchor, unmanned barges must display a red flag during the daytime. These flags may be metallic. The next item pertains to the requirement for cargo hatch covers to be closed when transferring any cargo requiring a pressure vacuum valve or safety relief venting device. These cargos can be identified in the table shown in part 151.05 of Title 46 Code of Federal Regulations. As noted on the form, no entry should be made unless hatches are required. By observing and questioning the tanker man in charge of the operation, the inspector must determine whether or not a sufficient number of qualified men are on duty to permit safe transfer operations. The certificate of inspection for the barge must always be available for review. Inspectors should check the certificate closely to make sure it is endorsed for the cargo which is being transferred. 
also to see if any loading restrictions are noted for the barge. Another critical item is for proper cargo transfer connections. As with tank vessels, flange connections must have at least three bolts drawn up tight. And drip pans or buckets must be provided under hose connections. The final item on the checklist is to determine that no prohibited explosives are on board. Explosives shall not be loaded or carried aboard a barge carrying any products regulated by Part 151 of Title 46 CFR. As indicated in Item 6 of the instructions, inspection should not be limited to items on the checklist. The form has space for noting violations or statutes or regulations not specifically covered by the checklist. A common example for unmanned tank barges would be a violation of the requirements for proper venting under various conditions as defined in Part 151.15 of Title 46 CFR. All that remains to complete the barge inspection is the signature of the boarding officer. The facility or vessel operator does not receive a copy of the form. This item-by-item -item discussion of Vessel Inspection Report CG 4393A is intended only to acquaint captain of the port inspectors with the basic procedures of good inspection. For specific requirements of the checklist items, inspectors must rely on Title 46 CFR, Parts 35 and 151. They must have a working knowledge of these texts and during inspections always have them available. The conscientious and intelligent use of the inspection form and applicable parts of Title 46 Code of Federal Regulations, Part 35 and 151, will guarantee a good inspection. And good inspections are one of the most vital parts of the port safety program.